This is Glambition Radio, episode number 196 with Jesse Woolley Wilson, CEO and president of Dreambox. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and mom of twins. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are rewriting the rules for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And we're doing it with style. Let's go. First off, I want to give a quick shout out to two amazing reviews that my team pulled from iTunes. We really appreciate it when you take a minute to leave us a review. It helps us with our visibility. It helps give more confidence to the women who are considering subscribing to the show. And I know you're listening. So thank you. I appreciate it. So first is Elisa Goodman from LA. Saddle up and have a listen. Inspiration to ride off with. The stories from these women are generously shared, the good, bad, and the ugly, as they unpack the truth of what it takes, the mistakes even the most successful women make, the upsets and lucky accidents, and the sheer chutzpah of following their feminine intuition when people told them they were crazy to do so. You can read the rest on iTunes. And a big thank you from Kim from Washington State. Love you, Allie. Thanks for what you're doing. Blessings and can't wait to meet you in person one of these days. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Those mean so much to us. And here's a little tip. We're going to have another journal giveaway coming up this spring. And if you even write a review now, we will count that toward the giveaway later. Okay. We'll explain how, but just take a minute now, if you have some time and leave us that review, you can do it right on your phone. Okay. Thank you so much. Now, my guest today Jesse Willie Wilson is CEO and president of an education technology company. It's called Dreambox, which to be frank, I'd never heard of until I read about her in Inc. and Fast Company last year. And I'm thinking this gal is doing something pretty amazing, not only with the company, but when I learned more about her story, there are just so many things I want you to pay attention to in this interview, how she approached things, decisions she made, how she thinks differently about leadership than many of us do. Just so many gems. This is going to be one you want to listen to again and again. And as a parent, I have to tell you that I shared this in the interview. I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to learning with tech. I don't want that substituting for them learning human interaction and doing things on their own. But Jesse really explained it well. She said, listen, this isn't here to replace teachers. It's to supplement. And especially for the education that some kids sadly don't get as well as other kids in our country. She shares that today. Dreambox serves millions of K through eight students, hundreds of thousands of teachers. They are one of the best funded education tech companies in the country. And Reed Hastings, who founded Netflix, is actually the one who tapped her. So, so much to share. Get ready for a fascinating conversation with Jesse Woolley Wilson. Jesse, can you share where you are right now? I am in our Bellevue office looking at snow-capped mountains after having received several inches of snow, which is unusual. <laughs> yeah. Now, is it is that somewhere? Have you been there a while up there? Do you love it? I've been here for about nine years. I came here to run Dreambox Learning, and I came from Washington, the other Washington, yeah. Washington, D.C. I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I do, but it's really, there's a lot happening in Seattle, and there's a lot of amazing women yeah. professionals in Seattle. Yeah. yeah. It's a great area. Besides the it weather, I, I could see myself up there. It's just a, mm-hmm. a big sunshine person. <laughs> so I first read about you and Fast Company. And then as I kind of went down the rabbit hole, you know, of media and learning <laughs> more about you, I have to say, I don't even know if I'm more fascinated with what you've created or who you've become in the process. Mm, because it's been, you know, nothing bores me more than people with like very linear careers. Mm. And you've been through some really interesting kind of evolutions. And I wanted to know if we could start there. Sure. Absolutely. Can we go way back? 
How way back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I read a particularly touching story about your family, you know, mm-hmm. when growing up here and your father, you know, really valued academia and becoming a surgeon. And could we, could we start there? Because it really kind of set the tone for who you started off, you know, where you started to be. Sure. I feel so grateful and privileged to have, to have the parents I have. My father came to the United States in 1956 as an immigrant from Haiti. And he says he was equipped with a great education, his faith, and family. And he felt like, although he had choices and it was very tumultuous in Haiti, many people went to Switzerland or France or Francophone Africa because of the political unrest, he chose to come to the United States. Still, and it was pre-civil rights. So he had heard stories about Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy in particular, And he felt supremely confident that America was a place that had amazing opportunity. And if he worked hard, he could create a a life for himself and his family. And then he met my mother. It just gives me chills. Yeah. Yeah, I love hearing that. It's it's an amazing story. And it's the relevant story right now as we think about rethinking our our policy and procedures around immigration. As I, you know, I'm one of seven kids and I really believe that. Our community in America has been made stronger because of what my parents have have built together. Mm. My mom, if you if you looked at my cell phone underneath my mother's name, Mavis Woolley, you would see her title as CEO of the Woolley family. (laughs) I shared that. (laughs) I shared that with her one one Christmas, and she was like, kind of, you know, a little proud, but kind of like a little surprised. Because when you have seven kids and two sets that were less than a year apart, as a mother, you know, that's craziness. And still, what she instilled in us was a belief that we could do anything we set ourselves out to do. Mm. And she set a very high bar for the best effort. I remember coming home from school and complaining that I had gotten a B plus when I knew I deserved an A and I knew my best friend in class got an A minus in that class. And I actually thought that my paper was superior and I got a B plus and she got an A minus. And I remember complaining to my mother and my mother said, before you get into all of the things that you want, that I know you want to talk to me about, I have one question for you. Do you believe that you put forth your best effort? And I said, yeah. I mean, it was a great paper. She said, did you start it as early as you could? Did you edit as many times as you could? Did you research it as well as you could have? And I'm like, well, and she said, okay, well, first, before you tell me all the things that should have happened to you by your teacher, tell me what you could have done to have had a better outcome. And I was like, she's a tough mama. I'm telling you. <laughs> and I was like, can you just say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. And no, that wasn't Give happening. No hug. No yeah. hug. And she said, you don't realize how fortunate you are. You have an excellent education. You don't have worries that so many people have. And she grew up in a very modest upbringing. And she said, you just don't realize how lucky you are. And my parents just pounded that into us. So I I used to tutor Mm -hmm. kids growing up in school. And and I always, I enjoyed that. I like school. And I enjoyed that. And I think it's so interesting that I sit here uh, leading a, a learning company when that was not the original plan at all. Yeah. Do you think that, well, the, the turning point that particularly interested me was that, you know, you, you started off in a, a career that was very, you know, you, you, you checked all the boxes. You, you went to the big schools, right? You got the <laughs> MBA. You then went into, I think it was financial. Is that where you were at for a while? So you were kind of yeah. doing that academia, like that, that was the dream, yeah. right? Getting the big finance job and all that. And so tell us about that time in your life. And then I know some changes happened. Yeah. You know, when you're the daughter of an immigrant, sometimes you're reminded about all the stress that your parents uh, left in order to come to where they are now, in our case, America. And sometimes they are willing to live with a lot of self-sacrifice and to defer enjoyment and pleasure for future generations. And so you feel that burden. And it's not so much what you want to do. It's what you can do to position the family for generational success. And so that has an upside and a downside. It has an upside because you learn at a a young age that it's it's not just about you. And I think that can help as you begin a leadership journey. But the downside is you have a lot of guilt. 
if you want to pursue the thing that feeds you. So I wouldn't say that diversified financial services. That wasn't on your vision me. board. Yeah. <laughs> when you were little. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't on my vision board. No, yeah. No. But impressive. But I was really excited about yeah. going to New York City. And I found, you know, in a few late nights working in banking that something was missing. I was yearning for something. So I, I reflected and I, I remember just being more content when I was doing something in service to the community. Uh, I went to Ursuline Academy, which is an all-girls Catholic school, and part of the philosophy there is Servium. And so it was kind of part of our upbringing in our house, and it was part of our education system at Ursuline. And I knew it was a missing component, so I started teaching kids. I would get on the, late at night, I would get on the A train, go up to Harlem, and tutor some middle schoolers, you know, from like 6 to 7.30, maybe 7 to 8, and then come back and go back to work. And it sounded crazy, but I had a little jump in my step, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And what I enjoyed was the same thing that frustrated me. I would talk to these young students, and I would see their brilliance. I would see their spark. I would see what they were able to do from a position of scarcity. And I knew, I knew in my heart that I would not be as successful and productive as they were if I were in their same. That really affected you, they, didn't it? They had something I lacked. It, it did. And I said, what's the difference between me and Malcolm or whomever it was I was tutoring? And the difference was I had great parents and I had access to the best education money could buy. And partly because I was in a, a zip code that was, you know, that had access to great teachers that delivered access mm -hmm. to great educational opportunities. And partly because I had people who believed in me who never let me believe that things happened to me because the world was bad. And, you know, maybe there's a downside to that because the world sometimes is bad, but I was resolute and I was determined that my best was good enough. I actually believed that my best was good enough. And that isn't always the case, but it propelled me. And then I remember calling my parents and saying, I know what I'm going to do. I'm leaving this career path and I am going to do something in education. I said, oh, you're going to be a teacher. I said, mm, I don't think I have the patience for that, but I think I can apply my business acumen and figure out a way to make it easier for teachers to find more time. Mm. For so you, were, you, you did connect the dots though. You started I thinking about it. it. So the, the dots were there. Okay. Ah, I did. I didn't know what it was though, because 20 years ago, people with MBAs didn't do what I did. You know, I told my friends I was stepping off and they said, you know, I have a great analyst. You should go see my analyst. She's awesome. Because <laughs> they thought I was having like a little bit of a breakdown. And I remember really feeling some trepidation calling my parents and because I said, okay, they've made all these sacrifices. They could have lived lives they didn't live so that I had access to this and that whole like generational thing. Am I being selfish here? And they they said something like, what a blessing it is that you found something that you're willing to walk away from one definition of wealth to embrace another definition of wealth. And I'm like, what definition? Well, wealth really, at the end of the day, my father said, is the ability to do what you want to do instead of what you have to do. I'll never forget that. And they were so supportive and they were just so confident that I was going to be able to have a have a good life, a good life, not a rich life, but a good life that they didn't burden me with, with guilt from the change in career path. That's amazing. That Were they still like, can you hang your MBA in the wall at least, you know, can we see it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think they would have said, you know, here's a check for $5,000. Right, right. I don't but think that was going to happen. Uh, that's just so good to hear. But but yeah. I think they're like she'll figure yeah. it so out. So yeah. where did you go? Were you like wandering the streets? Like did you take a job? Like what what well, happened? So when I was at Harvard Business School, I was the arts editor on the newspaper there called The Harvest, and a colleague of mine was the um, tech editor, and he actually landed in New York too, and he called me and he's like, "Are you still chasing those those education dreams?" I said, "Well, I I volunteer." This was before I made the decision, and he said, "Well." Stanley Kaplan is about to sell Kaplan test prep to the Washington Post. 
And the folks at the Washington Post are pulling together business leaders to manage different parts of the business. Because we think this can oh be Oh my gosh, that was your dream. Business. Perfect. More kids. <laughs> and Well, actually, I said, his name was Robert. I said, Robert, test prep is in education. Oh, you like, weren't associating it. Okay. I'm going to do something. I wasn't making the connection. And he said, Jesse, I've, I've known you for a long time. And you're telling me that the work that you do in education is not relevant to test prep. You had the privilege of having parents who not only told you to take the SAT, but probably told you to take right, the right. PSAT. And so at your dinner table, you're talking about test prep as a success factor for college. How many, especially immigrant families, don't have that? And I thought, oh, that's a good point. It's about access and opportunity. So that was my pathway in. I went to Kaplan. That's where I started. And I ran the pre-college and pre-graduate programs. And um, that was the first step wow. on this journey. Wow. So let, let's talk about Dreambox. Do you mind if I jump there? Sure. What was interesting to me is, first of all, I'm fascinated. Now that I have twins, they're six, watching how they learn. Yeah. I, I could watch it all day. <laughs> watching. And as a parent, you know, once they they start getting into the school years, you really start questioning and looking at how they're learning, going, is this the best? And mm. how do they really learn? And do mm-hmm. there's different kinds of schools and what's going to match their learning. And then now, you know, the schools mm-hmm. are bringing in the tech. And and I think it, to me as a parent, I've heard from some people it all has a bad rap. You know, the schools are just pushing computers mm-hmm. in now to substitute for teachers. But Dreambox does sound different. So I'm I'm coming to you both as a fascinated interviewer and a skeptical parent <laughs> at the same time. Mm-hmm. So so tell me about it. How did this idea was the idea was there before you came on board, and then you drove it? You know, or or you know, tell me about that. Getting into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, first I would say it's understandable that you as a parent have skepticism. I'm part of an industry that has been overpromising and underdelivering for decades. And so not only are parents skeptical, but learning guardians, teachers, tutors, coaches, principals, administrators, they're skeptical too. And it's justified. That makes it harder for solutions like Dreambox that are actually delivering on the promise because of this calcified skepticism. So Dreambox, we started out at Dreambox before I got here. It was founded by some folks before I got here. And their vision was simple. It was to delight and surprise the learner. There was a philosophy that if you could deliver personalized, engaging, and efficacious learning experiences, that most every child would thrive. They would grow academically, but more importantly, they would love to learn. And you would put them on a pathway for lifelong learning. So let's face it, kids now are going to have a lot more jobs and a lot more employers yeah. than maybe we did. The, the time when you spent 30 years at a GM and had a high school diploma and could put your kids through college and have your slice of the American dream are quickly going away. So we are really in Dreambox. We feel like we're in the business of teaching kids to learn how to learn. And we use a technology that we developed. It's called Intelligent Adaptive Technology to help us understand how kids are thinking Not are they memorizing things and applying rules and procedures, but are they giving a chance to think deeply and critically, to form their own hypotheses, to test their hypotheses, to discover, oh my goodness, my my hypotheses didn't work, and to dig further to figure out why it didn't work and maybe to formulate a different hypothesis and move forward. Because when you think about what, what my engineers do here at Dreambox, they are given problems and they're asked to solve that problem. And they use critical thinking and deep thinking and they harness collective wisdom from their peers in order to build something fantastic. And yet we're not, the average kid doesn't have that experience in school. So at Dreambox, we created a K through eight math solution that helps kids love to learn math. We don't tell them what to do. We don't ask them to memorize. We created a series of virtual manipulatives that help them test their hypotheses. And what we found in research is that it helps them to develop a conceptual understanding of mathematics. We'll give you an example. So you have twins. So let's say your two twins are are on Dreambox and they're being asked to group numbers. And one of your twins says, I think I know how to do that. Dreambox is asking me to build the number 37. I'm going to build three tens 
a five, and two ones. So I'm going to take 10 beads, slide them over, do that three times, going to take five beads, and in four or five steps, they actually create the number 37. They don't get stuck. They don't ask for help. They're ready for the next challenge. Your other twin takes 37 Mm -hmm. individual beads Mm -hmm. and moves them over, one after another. They both get 37, right? But one grouped effectively and did it efficiently, and one didn't. So most adaptive programs would say both of them got it right, move them to the next lesson. That would never happen in Dreambox. Dreambox would say the first child is ready for maybe more complex grouping strategies. Let's see if they're really fluent and would make it more difficult and give them a new problem. With the second learner, Dreambox would say they're not even grouping at all. They're using individual digits. I'm going to pull them out of the lesson before they get frustrated. I'm going to move them earlier into the curriculum, give them some suggestions and scaffolding to help them understand what grouping is, and then give them a new problem and a new opportunity to be successful. So at Dreambox, we really focus on the difference between productive struggle and unproductive struggle. I think these are, I'm going to, sorry, I think these are some good management lessons as well. <laughs> like right? all your language and everything so you're true. saying, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I totally, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It applies oh, wow. in dating. Didn't think of that well, one. You know? I love this. I did, sorry, I, had, I just right? had, was bursting. I just loved it. No, but it's, it's so true. So what happens is a lot of times kids get frustrated. Before I came to Dreambox, I asked my, my nephew at the time, he was a third grader, tell Tati if she should go and, and help this company be successful. Can you tell me what you think about this program? And he said, Tati, I'm not good at math. I'm good at reading. You should ask my friend who's good at math. I'm like, you're in third grade. How can you have? So yeah. kids get frustrated. And it's because we're not meeting them where they are. We're not individualizing the learning experience and giving them what they need. So in that example, Dreambox would have taken the child out of the lesson before they got frustrated, moved them earlier into the curriculum, and then given them a new opportunity to be successful. And this happens dynamically, instantaneously. And so what we try to do is anchor kids in productive struggle because struggle isn't bad. But it has to be productive. It can't get to the point where it gets frustrated because, or, or, or yeah. where they get bored. Is it still like a, a new concept, essentially, for schools, like for kids to learn this way? Yeah, we don't know of any other solution that has bi-level, bimodal mm. adaptation, both within the lesson immediately, like I just described, and even between the lesson. So those two, your two twins, would get a different lesson. Yeah. Based on how they were solving the problem. Not that they got their answer right, but how they were thinking and how they solved the problem. And this happens instantaneously. And the end is that kids feel supported. Kids feel successful. Kids feel eager and ready to learn. And they yeah. enjoy who, the learning Who makes the buying um, process? That is who, the you, most from important. A, now, from the business point of view, I'm very curious. You know, you, you're now serving 3 million students. You're working with... Over, almost. Oh, wow. Okay. From a business standpoint, I'm curious though, who is your buyer? When you guys are trying to get into these schools, is it convincing the yeah. parents who then go to the school and say, listen, I heard about this thing. You've got to get it. Or is it the teachers or is it Board of Ed? I wouldn't even know mm-hmm. on my end. It's evolved. In the beginning, there were a lot of moms that were very active on PTAs who said, I've seen a transformation in my daughter and I don't want her to only have this at home. I want her to have it in schools. And they went to principals or foundations and they said, I want Dreambox in the school, Bellevue School District. That's one of the districts that that happened. But over time, as our, you know, our efficacy studies have come out and our brand awareness has kind of increased, we talk with teachers, with, with principals, with curriculum directors, with chief academic officers, with assistant superintendents mm-hmm. of instruction, all of those folks who are kind of in the learning community are people that we yeah. reach out to. Yeah. So if, there, if there's a mom listening now or dad, then then they could bring this to the school though, right? And you, they parents can sign up as well. I think mm-hmm. I saw on the website. Yes. So I didn't, when we came in, so Reed Hastings was our primary benefactor before the big um, transaction last year. And when he saw the technology, he's of course the CEO of Netflix. When he saw the technology, he said, wow, this could be a transformational technology. But at the end of the day, it can't just be available to kids whose parents are just on it and happen to know about it. Because at the end of the day, we might actually exacerbate the gap between the haves and the have-nots. We have to take this solution to school. Oh, that's how it happened. So that's why he, he recruited me 
from Blackboard to come and and run Dreambox a couple years after it was when I got here, there were maybe 11 people, basically a technology company, a technology. And then I built a company around it over the, the next, you know, handful wow. of years. So are you buddies with Reed? I mean, that's incredible. Well, he's a mentor. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm buddies, but I've, I've learned so much and grown so much as a leader working for such a value yeah. space. And, and I'm thinking now, maybe this was from like, you know, last year, you now lead one of the most well-funded ed tech companies as well. And you guys landed a big investment. Mm. And this is just great to hear because you hear from a lot of women in the spaces saying it's so hard to get funding. Do you want to talk about that for a minute yeah. and your experience with that and whether you agree with that or disagree or, you know, what's the landscape? Well, I think it is hard to get funding. And I think it's um, doubly hard for women and, and people of color. You know, I remember in, when I was for raising my first uh, $10 million, uh, I was sitting at a a big funder um, and waiting to give my pitch and somebody raced in late for their meeting, their pitch meeting and saw me and asked me to get them a cup of coffee. Oh. I didn't even think twice about it. There was no malice in uh. it, but they just saw me and they, in their mind, I was somebody who was there to serve them. And you have to figure out ways to metabolize those things. And I remember saying to that young man, I said, you know, I actually don't know where the coffee is here, but um, when you find it, if you wouldn't mind bringing me a cup well done. back, I, t I take it black. And his eyes and eyebrows went up to the sky and he was so, he was a little embarrassed, but he was so shocked more than embarrassed. And so part of it is that there are hidden figures and we talk a lot about what we can do to help women and people of color. And I think we have to focus on that. But what we also have to do is we have to shine a light on people like you. You know, there are women, amazing women who are doing amazing things all over this land that people don't know about. And so you and I talked a little earlier about the importance of showing up. One of the reasons I show up and I love talking with people like you is so that people get to see more women and more people of color doing yeah. things that they might not think that we do. So yeah, you should show up. We all have to show up because we have to get more to get more women, we have to get more people of color, but we also have to shine a light on the hidden figures that are already doing yeah. amazing yeah. things. And you're one of those people that, you know, I wouldn't have known your name before, but then started reading about Fast Company. And then I'm like, wow, I got to follow this woman and learn more about her and tell more people about her. <laughs> and I, we all need to do this. And there are more yeah. women out yeah. there. Yeah. So we were thrilled when TPG tapped us and said, you know, they have a impact fund called the Rise Fund that is focused on three areas, healthcare innovation, educational innovation, and environmental slash energy innovation. And they came to us and we felt they were a great partner because they were as concerned about having a lasting and sustainable impact on the future of learning as they were in building a successful company. And so one of the things that I appreciate now that I didn't appreciate when I raised my first $10 million was that you're picking your partners as well. You know, you go into those meetings, those pitch meetings, and you're like, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get them to say yes? And that's a natural part of what you're doing. But I wish I had appreciated them that you also have to be very selective and make sure that your investors and your funders care about the things you care about. And I care about kids and I believe in kids. And I care about unlocking learning potential because I feel like it's the first step in unleashing human capability. And your kids are going to have new problems and big problems that you and I didn't face growing up. And we've got to help them, help prepare them to learn so that they can harness collective wisdom, they can lock arms with people who have shared values and make this world a better place for themselves and for their progeny. I take that very yeah. seriously. I can tell it's just, it's just who you are. That's what I felt the, the first time I read about you. There was a, you know, you can get kind of vibes from interviews and what people say and stuff. And there's a, there's a real congruence in who you are and what you're doing. And sometimes, you know, you see people and then they're not, there's not, if you know what I mean? This mm. is just, you wake up and this is how you are and who you are and what you're doing. And it's all just, it's, you've got this flow. I think the moment you walked out of that financial job, this flow turned on. You were just so aligned with your purpose. There was one little thing, though, that caught my eye I want to ask, and I'm going to change gears for a minute. And it's yeah. it's on like your leadership okay. and management. And you talked about something that I circled in big red pen. It's benevolent friction. I was like, ooh, ooh, 
ooh, ooh, ooh, let's talk about this. <laughs> so, you know, I remember growing up with a lot of my aunties and uncles around me. And, you know, we would sit down at the, at the table, dinner table, and my father might say, well, what did you read in the paper today that you found interesting? And what was interesting about it? You know, so you really had to, like, come prepare for some kind of discussion. And it was it was benevolent, but it was freaking, he was preparing us for leadership, right? My parents were preparing us for leadership. And when I came to Dreambox, I, over the course of my career, I've come to appreciate the courageous conversations. So I came up with this term, I called it benevolent friction. And I, I encourage the team here to be hard on ideas, but soft on people. Our work is so important that we can't bring ego. We can't wrap our ideas with our ego. We have to subject our, what we think are great ideas to the scrutiny of people who share our values and share our goals for kids so that a good idea becomes a great idea or something that we think is a great idea becomes even better. And so you have to leave your ego in the parking lot and then come into this collective enterprise to try to reshape the future of learning. And I feel like if you do that, then you will grow, definitely, but you will also create more value for the people we serve. And I think it also can impact your leadership voice and it can inspire people to tell more truths. And as leaders, sometimes people spend a lot, we, we discover that people spend more time trying to figure out what we want to hear instead of what the truth is. And I want to protect myself against that. I always want people to feel like they can challenge me and challenge my ideas if it's better for the people that we're serving including yeah. each other. So how do you foster way. that? Like when, when you have a new team member come on board, someone you're working closely with, do you just have a conversation around this or is there a process that you train them to, to use? Yeah. Well, I developed some company values when I came here. Um, and I feel like it's not like I imposed them. I, I feel like I discovered them. This was an amazing company made up of amazing people when I came. And I just put labels on things, you know, so be adaptive is one of them. Constantly learning is another. Do well first to do good in a scalable way is another. Focusing on effort with impact. It's not just about doing things. It's about making sure that Mm. what you're doing has impact. And one of them Mm -hmm. is benevolent friction. And so that's part of our onboarding and it's part of our, you know, and I actually had an engineer come into me. He said, well, how do you, how do you get that to take hold? It's, you have to embrace vulnerability And you have to admit as a leader when you're wrong. And one of my top engineers came in about two years ago and said, Jesse, can I talk to you? And he never comes in. And I said, absolutely. And he sat down and he said, there's something I want to share with you. And I think that you're an an excellent leader for extroverts. And I'm like, I don't think that was a compliment. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, well, tell me more about that. He said, well, I'm very introverted, and as are many people on the on my team. And now that I'm part of the leadership team, I just wonder if, if I'm going to be as successful as I might, if I'm going to be able to contribute as much as I want to because of how you lead it. And I was like, wow, well, tell me more. And he said, you know, I'm introverted. And when you're, you know, in the meeting and you're like, what do you think? What do you think? And you're going at pace and you're asking people to think on their feet really quickly. I mean, like introverts sometimes like to sit with things. You're going to get really good feedback from them, but it might not be on the fly. And I said, Lorenzo, I want to thank you for the courage that it took to come in and tell me that I could be a better leader. Because you're one person, but my guess is that there are many people out there who feel the same way as you did. And thank you for the courage. That is benevolent friction. So let's partner. You can help me be a better leader. What do I need to do? And he said, well, I want to think about that. And I'll come back to you with a good recommendation. Mm. So we came back in about a week equipped with a book called Quiet. And it's a book about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, I read this book to learn more about myself. And I think you might benefit from it. I've read that book twice. (laughs) And I'm a better leader because of that. In a company meeting, I got up and I told it. I asked him if I could tell that story. And I told that story at a company meeting. And I, within 30 minutes at the end of the company meeting, I think I had 30 emails from introverts all across the company. Now there are about 250, 260 people at Dreambox saying, uh, now I know you're serious about what you mean when you say you want to support big D diversity. And I've never been at a company where the leadership is trying to make sure everybody 
can bring their best self forward. Yeah. Introverts, extroverts, women, men, gay, straight, etc. But it was painful to have that conversation because he is outstanding. And I was potentially yeah. going to lose this guy because I didn't know how my leadership was impacting him. I think if we hadn't had the benevolent friction culture, I don't think he would have had a platform to come in and say, Jesse, I, I want to talk to you about something and I want to engage in a little benevolent friction. I'm like, oh, mm. I got to give him credit. You know? I, I cannot imagine coming into your cool. office telling you <laughs> what you could do better. As a <laughs> no, wow. but seriously, I thought a lot about that and I reflected. And, you know, when you're running a small company, and you're trying to make things work and you're trying to figure out what you have to do very quickly and you're working at pace, you don't always show up as your best self. And that's a lesson I should have learned a long time ago. And I, I can't imagine also coming into, you know, I've always started my own businesses. I can imagine it's a whole other layer of complexity when you are coming into something that has already been birthed and is growing and this great yes. team. I mean, I, I really give kudos to anyone who comes into these positions because you're bringing your vision and what you want to bring. And then you have to do a lot of listening, man. You have to yeah. do a lot. It was hard in the beginning. I remember asking Reed for advice and he said, well, what are you trying to accomplish? And I said, I need to change culture. You know, this isn't about making sure that wealthy parents, kids don't have to only go to the University of Washington and they can go to MIT. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to make sure that people who don't even know about yeah. Dreambox get exposed to Dreambox so that we can unleash their human capability. And so I need to change culture here. And he's like, well, you can change culture, but my, what I would encourage you to think about is transitioning from changing culture to evolving mm -hmm. culture. And if you ask people to evolve culture, then you don't have to ask them to recriminate and regret anything because change sometimes means something isn't working and you're going to go in a different direction. What if you give them the opportunity to leverage the strong foundation that intelligent adaptive technology is like market leading? There's a lot of great things. And why don't you invite them to lock arms with you to evolve the culture so you can make something really sustainable mm. with big impact? One word difference. I came in, I gave a presentation about culture evolution. I asked them for their help. And here we are. I'm still here nine years later. I mean, such a subtle leadership lesson, but so profound. Yeah. Right. If so you lucky. teach a leadership course, I'm signing up. I love talking with you. And, <laughs> no and you know, you, you need to have books and all this stuff. In the, in the meantime, you're growing this company and you're on like 26 boards, by the way, <laughs> which is fantastic. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask one quick last question just and then we're going to we can head down the final highway. How can we as women leaders get on boards? You, you, you've had a knack to get on some incredible boards of uh, different companies, organizations. Do you have any quick tips on where we would start if we're interested in doing something like that? So a couple things come to mind. The first is sometimes people believe that they should pursue a board just to pursue a board and, and check it off. They should understand that boards are a lot of work and they're going to have to make choices and they're going to spend less time with their family and with their companies. And they should just make sure mm -hmm. that they know what they're asking for and they're stepping into it. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second is that there are stepping stones to sitting on, a, say, a publicly traded board. And I spent a lot of time with nonprofit organizations and leadership roles at nonprofit organizations. And I learned about how to be a good board member at a smaller scale where mm -hmm. there was less risk. So I really encourage women to do that. And when they do do that, to do something that feeds them because you're going to have to stretch. Yeah, you're going to have to great idea. more. So start locally. Yeah, I think sometimes people say, Start locally and and don't go in, in with the perspective of what can right. I get. I want from this for my LinkedIn get profile. Out of it? Go in with the perspective. <laughs> that's right. What can I give to it? Because ultimately, when you join a board, they're going to ask for mm -hmm. people who've worked with you. And if you're all about you and all about what you can get from it, mm -hmm. that's going to come through. So I would really encourage women to think about what they could give, what impact they can have, and how success will look if they spend two years at, a, at an organization, because all that's going to yeah. be stepping stones for board. Great place to start. Uh, Thank service. you. Everyone, you have to go take a look at dreambox.com. And I'm going to do the parent option. I think I'm going to sign up and, and see how the kids like it. I want to ask uh, my, my last question is, can you share three of your best pieces of advice to wrap up, Jesse? Sure. 
First, I'd say pursue what feeds you, you know, follow your passions. I spent six years doing something that didn't feed me. And those were years wasted, maybe. I learned something from, but I could have gotten to it earlier. When I actually, when I talk to new hires at Dreambox, I ask them, what is the thing that they love to do, even when it's really, really difficult, because they still find joy in it. Mm. Secondly, I would say, surround yourself, especially early on, with people who believe in you and your promise. People who support your aspirations and are willing to risk your disappointment or anger to tell you the truth. We need truth tellers around us to keep us honest with ourselves and humble so that we can stay motivated to continue to grow, to learn, Mm -hmm. to get better and stronger. So if you find yourself surrounded by pessimistic people who can't help you see past impediments toward possibilities, you should Mm -hmm. revisit the company you keep. And then the last thing I'd say is prepare yourself for luck. I'm here talking to you now, Allie, because I am lucky. I've been lucky. So study hard, work hard, be humble, be honest about what your weaknesses are and improve them so that you're ready when opportunities oh. present themselves. You never know when opportunities will arise and we should always stay ready. I, I love to this. Advantage. I just want to keep talking to you, but you have a business to run. Fantastic. Thank you so much, <laughs> Jesse. This was a refreshing, Thank you. just extraordinary conversation. And just keep doing what you're doing. We're, we're excited to keep watching. We're excited to support Dreambox. And, and let us know how we can support you. Please keep in touch with us. Well, thank you very much. And you're doing important things too. Thank you for all you do to shine a light on hidden figures. Thank you. Stay warm up there. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get new shows every week. And I'd love if you left us a review. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And I'd love to hear from you. Come join the conversation online. You'll mostly find me on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Just head to AllieBrown.com. You will find them all there. And you can also learn about upcoming opportunities to meet in person. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you've tuned in. 